we were talking about last certain types of, of, of rows. And so we were, able to actually, we were actually able to grab specific rows in our, in our data. And then we used the command here called arrange, which is another function, which is built into tidyverse. And arrange was very similar to a kind of a sort command. Now, as we go through these commands, I want you to think in terms of, um, you know, of like using spreadsheets here, because basically our data set was a kind of a spreadsheet. And so these commands that we have built in are really ways of interacting with the spreadsheet in the ways that we've already been doing before. We've, we've already been sorting things, and we've already been selecting certain rows. And so these are commands that automate that process for us. Um, then we were able to use the, uh, we used the select command here, and the select was able to go after specific entities in our, in our, our database, our, our, our spreadsheet, rather. And so we were able to now to pull out specific rows according to certain types of criteria, which is another very important, uh, another very important tool that we were that we were able to use. Um, and so the, um, we, I mean, we, you could actually the, the reason why that was important for you know, in our in our particular case was that you might find that you have some huge, uh, I don't know, a huge data set, and you might think that uh, you don't need all that data for your specific research. And so why not just pull out specific things that you'd like to focus on? And so we were able to use the select to actually grab those rows and select those specific uh, rows for which we had some interest. Um, then we use this mutate command. And by the way, I'm not just going through these things. I, uh, the, the actually, there are actual um, examples in your slides on how to use these things. Um, so you can find them there if you're interested. But we use the, the mutate function to go through and um, actually create a new column of data for us. So the select was able to kind of grab the, the columns here, but now we're able to get, use the mutate uh, to grab, oh, sorry, sorry to, to, to create new columns. And that was important because uh, you might think that um, you need to do some kind of calculation. You have all the data there in your database, or I keep saying database, but your spreadsheet, but in your data set, you have all the data that you need, um, except you need to make one calculation. Maybe you need to transform your data. Maybe you need to take the, uh, the, the fast Fourier transform of, uh, of some column of data uh, for your analysis. And maybe something mathematical has to happen to one of your columns uh, before you can proceed with your analysis. Um, and so the mutate command was, allow, uh, was allowing us to actually create that mathematical computation or to, to do something. In our specific example here, we just, we just copied a, a column over. Um, then we have the summarize function, and the summarize was able to take some of the data that we were putting into it, group it together, and then to give us some, um, you know, to, to work with that grouped data as, as essentially a simple uh, column of its own. And so in this case, I'll just go to the end here. Um, but summarize we use to group together, um, in, this, in this example here, we're grouping together the uh, year, month, and the day data, and then getting the mean of the, um, was it the uh, departure delay. And so you can see in this, you can't really see where my cursor is, I do apologize for that, but if you look to the right of where I am right now, in, this, in the graphic, um, I'm sorting my data, and then I'm grouping my data by month and day. So in other words, I'm saying, that, you know, that they'll give you the, the means for the departure delay for the day, uh, one for day two, for day three, for day four, and that's all for the same year and the same month. And so this summarize command is actually quite a useful command to us because it, uh, in that, in each day, for instance, we may have had, I don't know, 10, 15, I'm not exactly sure how many there were, but there are several different measurements of, of the departure delay. And so then we were able to take that information, put it together as one big group of numbers here, or one data set, a subdata set, uh, and then to calculate the mean, and then to report to the screen in this nice orderly uh, uh, table output here. And so that's what Summarize does, and so it helps us to kind of work with the data. Now, I'm hoping that, um, that all of these, these commands here, while they may not seem relevant to you yet, I'm hoping that they're beginning to kind of sink in and that you begin to see that they are, um, they, they do have some value. In other words, if you're working with a big data set and you don't need all that data, rather you just need a, a subset of that data, um, then you can go after that subset. Now you have the, the ability to grab a column or grab a row or grab a specific you know, part of that row or that, a specific part of that column um, so that you can do your analysis. And so this is really what they call wrangling. Uh, wrangling is when you take your data set and you're moving things around and you're changing things around and you're, you're, you're really kind of creating a, um, 
a data set that you can use for your analysis. I think that in, in analytics, um, at least in my experience, I don't know about other people's experience, but in my experience, the wrangling, or the, the wrangling time or the, the, the rearranging of, of my data or the focusing on specific subsets of data, uh, that's the part that takes the most time. Um, and so don't despair. If you're, if you're, if you're spending, um, let's say you're spending like an hour on doing some kind of a, an analysis here and you, and you find out that you spend uh, 45 minutes of that analysis time actually just moving things around and getting ready to do the analysis, and the last you know, 15 minutes is actually spent on the analysis itself, that's about normal. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's generally what happens. You'll find that it's, it's um, you're, when you, when you, in, any, in any area, it seems, of analysis, you always spend less time actually running the program than you do actually getting the things in place and in order. Okay, so I wanted to, to um, take you through um, a new data set here. This is only going to last, uh, I think we'll, we'll spend maybe five to ten minutes on this, and then we'll, um, then we'll, we'll move on to the next slide today, um, which are actually waiting for you in your, um, in your, um, uh, your, your, your class docs repository. I have amended these slides here that we're looking at now, so if you haven't pulled them over, please do, and find the new updates on the, on the slides. But um, the... Uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and get started. I just wanted to take you through and kind of show you uh, how we could use um, what this is doing here. Um, how we could use some of this, uh, some of these tools here to to do a, a very basic, but kind of fun uh, <laughs> experiment. So let me go ahead and get my. I can find my my thing here. Um, here's your R Studio, and we're over. Okay. It takes me some time to find these windows on my computer. I don't make, want to make it seem like I'm getting lost on my own machine. That's really not what's happening at all. Um, it's just that you don't see what I see, but on my screen, it's just a mess of different windows, all of them open. They have to be open because the system that I use to broadcast the, the, uh, the, the scenes that I have, everything has to be open. And so I have to like dig through all of these windows to find it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. OK. Um, let us go ahead and start this. And so going back to the slides, let's see, what are we, what are we loading here? We are loading a data set. Um, we have, there's a new data set we can load here if we want. I think that some of this stuff is already included in uh, Tidyverse, but I'll just go ahead and put that here now just to have it because I might, I want, I might want this. Um, I'll take you through how to actually load this. Remember that when you are, if you're loading a library um, like this, ggplot2, this is something that perhaps we have never worked with before. So what you might want to do is you might want to install something, you might want to install the library first. And that's going to be install packages. Oops. And then you have to put the library name in quotes. It's funny how you have to put this in quotes uh, when you're installing it, but once it's in your computer, you don't need quotes, which is just extraordinary. Um, I'll put the date here today. We are the 1st of October, 2020. And then I'm going to save this as my note for 2020, just because I want to be able to kind of get back to this information when, I, uh, when, I'm, when I'm reviewing my notes later on. So I'm going to save this right now. I'm choosing a directory where um, everything has to go, someplace that's kind of out of the way, but something that I can actually find again, which tends to be my big problem here. I might save a file, but it's not always easy to actually get that file back. OK, so I've just saved my thing here. I just called it one October notes, not very interesting, but that's just me. Um, so now I'm going to, now that I have this, this command right here, I um, hope you can see this. Um, I don't know, let me just ask the people who, if you're watching this at home, is your graphic of this, of this screen, is this um, slightly blurry? Does anyone, does it, I mean, I'm looking at the screen right now and it seems that it's not, maybe it's getting better. I don't know whether our internet here isn't very good. I do apologize, though, if it, uh, if it looks like it's blurry. If anyone sees that it, it's blurry, maybe just wait for a moment, and then it seems to focus itself. But on the screen that we have up there, it doesn't seem to um, it's a little blurry. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I think it's, I think it's our internet connection. It's not very good today. I'll be frank with you. Sometimes in the building, we don't have the best internet connection, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. <coughs> I think that has something to do <coughs> with Maybe they're doing some kind of, um, maybe I think when everyone's using Zoom, perhaps they're using Zoom upstairs or something, then I think that it really slows everything down. Um, I'll just keep going and see whether that makes any difference at all. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be. Okay, so, well, thank you, Rachel. It's, it's a little bit blurry, but it's not too hard to read. Thank you very much. That's um, very meaningful to me. Well, anyway, I'll just keep going, and I hope that it'll, it'll clear itself up. 
But I do apologize if it's hard to read, so just bear with me. Okay, so anyway, I have my package here. I have my installed packages with ggplot. I'm going to hit the run, and I think that I've installed this before in this machine. No, I haven't. Uh, and so if I haven't installed this before, then I'm going to see something that looks like this. Uh, and that tells me that my package has installed. Uh, you'd otherwise you'd see something like a, your package had an error or you had a, there was a problem. You'd see something, there's a non-zero exit error message or something. You'd, you'd see something to suggest that it didn't actually install properly. Anyway, so we have ggplot. Now, the next thing we're going to do, I'll just go back to my slides and see what, um, we're going to be working with this, uh, this data set here called diamonds. Actually, you know what? I should probably, let me just go back and install the stuff that we've already been using. Uh, we have something called tidyverse, remember? Tidyverse. That's another important library that you want to load. Um, if you haven't installed that library package, then please do use this command here. And instead of having the ggplot2, you would change that with tidyverse. And so that would be how you would install that. But remember, though, that you only need to install this once. So I'm going to put this hashtag in front of my, in front of my code. And that suggests um, that I, if I need it, I can use it. Um, but I don't want to run this every time I run my program because I'll be running this on this machine and I don't need to install this package each time I use it. That will just take me a whole lot of time. Um, right, so I'll just leave it as, as that. Now, going back to, and again, I'm lost in my windows here. Uh, I'll go back to my slides. And so we're going to be loading this new data set called Diamonds. And Diamonds is actually a very uh, interesting data set. Um, if you look at, uh, for instance, um, I'll just go ahead and put this here. I'm going to call this my data diamonds. When I run this, diamonds is actually built in, I believe, to tidyverse. I think it's part of the tidyverse library. In other words, you have to load this library uh, before you're able to actually access this diamonds um, data set. And the nice thing about these library packages is that when you get some new tool, some kind soul has given us the... Uh, some really nice organized data that we can use to try out the, analy the analysis packages that, we, that we've, just, we've just got. So that means that we can actually try out some of the statistics from Tidyverse using this package Diamonds. Now, if you go ahead and click on Diamonds, um, or the, the My Data, which we've actually said is, is the Diamonds data set, um, you'll see that the data comes up here. Hopefully everyone has the same page or they see the same thing here. Um, if you haven't, it might mean that you haven't loaded your libraries. So you go back and load your libraries. And then when you go back through this code again, where you just like load my data equals diamonds, diamonds is a built-in <clears throat> variable. And one thing I will say uh, about that is that not that you'd ever use diamonds as a, um, a as a variable name, but you might avoid using some of these uh, some of these words as variable names because they're built-in commands. So for instance, you wouldn't uh, have like you know. Uh, a variable called true or false because that's already built into the, the up or the um, the language. These are already they're already words that are semi taken. They have some value already in, in other areas, and so you wouldn't want to assign some new value to them. Um, okay, so going then back to the slides, what are we doing with this? We're going to be um, we're going to be going after. We're going to be using this data set to uh, to illustrate how to make a, a column here. But the first thing you want to do. Um, before we go any further, let me just take a moment to um, go back and appreciate this data set here and look and see what we can do. This data set um, concerns uh, different kinds of, uh, of diamonds here. So we have diamonds, um, I guess the, the quality of the diamonds is uh, measured in carats. Um, then we have um, when the diamonds, these are diamonds which have been cut, and so that means that there is different qualities of cut. There's an ideal quality of cut, there's a premium, there's good, there's very good. Uh, there's fair. Um, I'm just going down the column here and, and cut. But it seems that there's there's not too, too many there. There's not too many uh, different ways of describing diamonds. But somebody has actually gone through each diamond here and entered it into this uh, spreadsheet, into, this, into our data set. And they've, and they've looked at the, the cut, and they've decided whether it's ideal, premium, good, very good, uh, and so on. Um, then we have color. Now, I'm not exactly sure what these colors actually are, but these colors, E, I, J, H, F, um, those colors correspond to colors you'd use to s describe, I guess, certain types of clarity in the, in the diamonds. So maybe E would be, I'm going to electric blue, I'm, I'm just guessing, I don't know exactly what that means, but it, they are 
there are different kinds of colors, and if you're a, a gemologist, then these colors would, would mean something. I mean, you're not going to have colors like you know bright purple or neon pink. You, you wouldn't have those colors. Then you have um, the next column is called clarity, which is where I'm right here, and clarity. Uh, is, is talking about how when you hold the diamond up to the light, what you can see through the diamond. So if it's like, you know, if there's like little blemishes or if it's cloudy, then those all count against um, the, the value of the diamond. So some of the more expensive diamonds are, are ultra clear and they're almost like glass. Um, now this is a kind of a coding system here, S1 or SI2, SI1, VS1, VS2. I'm not exactly sure what, how that code system works. But in fact, if we wanted to find out more, we could type in question mark, D-I-A and, and then diamond. And then hopefully, I don't know whether we can get some information about this. Oops, actually it's diamond, uh, let's see. And remember that you can go down to your help down here um, and you can find out, again, it's a little bit blurry, but um, if you try this on your own machine, I do apologize for the quality of internet here. I, I don't know why we're getting so, so blurry, but I'll tell you, um, this, class will be made will be made available as a video and so if you can't see everything online then when I put this up on a video it should be much much more clear because you're actually looking at the screen and it never actually goes through the internet so it's more crisp so hopefully that'll be helpful but you can always put a question mark followed by the name of the data set diamonds and you can see what the diamonds are and so the color here we are diamond color from D best to J worst so it's a, it's a code Clarity is a measurement of how clear the diamond is. Let's see, I1 is the worst, and IF is the best. I'm not exactly sure how they come up with these codes, but it must mean something. Um, and then you have the X and the Y and the Z, which you can see um, over here with the, on the right-hand side. And these are the dimensions of that diamond. Each diamond has a different length and different width and different height. Um, so these are the, the dimensions you'd use to describe the size. And I'm thinking, oh, here's the, the depth. The depth is a mathematical equation that they've used to describe some kind of percentage, depth percentage. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but that must be another metric in determining some value of diamonds. And so you have all these, anyway, the, what I'm trying to say though is that when you get a data set though, it's worth your while to go through and, and see what kind of data you have, but not just uh, like you know, what the column names are, but actually, what kind do you have? Um, are they numbers? Uh, is it text? Uh, for instance, I'm looking at the alphanumeric quality of the, the, of the clarity column. Um, and that suggests uh, to me that uh, I, I, I would not be able to plot that data. That means that it's, a, um, it's, it's information which is, it's not numerical, it's textual. And so I could use that, as a, I could, I could use that in, in some text-based analysis. So, what I'm actually getting at is that uh, this will inform what kind of code you're going to be writing to actually do your analyses. Okay, so I think that maybe, <laughs> I think we've probably spent enough time doing that. Uh, let's go back to, where are we here? I'm going to go back to my OBS. Where are you? It's right here. Okay. So now, going back to the slides, um, what we're going to do is here, we're going to, um, I wanted to just do a, a simple plot here just to see what's, what's there. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, select this piece. And if I select that chunk down there, then what I'm going to do is I'll put this into, if I can get back to my, get back here, I'll just put that code into my notes and I'm going to run this and see what, what happens. This is what I call the back of the envelope uh, type of, of calculation here. By that, mean, by that I mean you are using, oh that's interesting, um, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're making a, a very basic uh, kind of assessment of your data by creating just, just some plots. Now, what I would recommend is you try all the plots. So just try doing as many different plots as you possibly can, just to kind of get a feel for what the data actually looks like. Now, I wanted to spend some time. I, I wrote this, I wrote this, this command here using the old-fashioned dialect of our programming. Before I get to the graph here, let me just, let me just talk about this error message that I've just seen here. And you're likely to see the same error messages when you download code online. Um, that is that uh, recently, I guess within the last, I would say, well, I would say within the last three years, uh, they have changed. R Studio has changed the way that they, you can that you can accept, you can put data in here. What I mean by that is that this part over here that I'm looking at, 
in my plot statement here, this is my x value of my Cartesian plot point is actually saying that this is the, uh, it's, it's actually corresponding to the caret information of my diamond data, which is now called my data. And my y is actually corresponding to the, in that same data set, my data, it's corresponding to the cut information. Now, one thing I can do, which I really like about, about R, is I can type in my data, and try this at home, actually, and try this here. But if I type in my data, and then I put a, quite, or a, a dollar sign at the end, you'll see now that I have this option of stuff. What is this option of stuff? Well, don't forget that this option that I see here, these are the columns of my data. And so if I go back and just type in my data, and I put a dollar sign there, then that means now that I can go after a specific kind of information. So I can say, give me the information that corresponds to color. And if I push enter, I get that data here. What else do I have here? Let's see, uh, I can do my data and uh, let's, see, uh, let's see the carrot. So what I'm trying to say is that when you use this kind of, um, I guess, notation or syntax, you're saying this is the data set, my data. Then you have your dollar sign. And then after the dollar sign, you have the column header. That's this stuff up here. Right, so what does that have to do with this, with this plotting command here? Well, in the plotting command, notice how we have this line here that says the data is equal to my data. Data is actually what we established early on, saying that this was actually the diamonds data set. I guess we could have just put diamonds. Oops, D-I-A-M, diamonds right here. I guess, I guess that could have worked too, <clears throat> but <coughs> Sorry, and then, but I'm just gonna, I'll just, I'll just I can, and I'll change this my data so that it now says, I'll just copy this because I'm lazy. I'm not very good at spelling either. But if I go ahead and say, okay, now we have ggplot where the data is actually talking about the diamonds, and now I'm saying that my x axis is corresponding to the diamonds data set, and inside that data set, I'm looking, I'm looking at the caret um, column. That's my x. My y is the diamonds data set, and I'm looking at the cut column. Now, when I go ahead and run this, I still get a plot, and we'll discuss this plot. Oops. Um, but I get these messages here, which are actually kind of confusing. And I think, why am I getting these messages? Well, what that's saying is that uh, since I have already established that I'm working with this data set, diamonds, I don't need to say again that I'm working with the data set here because it's the same data set. And so what this is, this is, this is R coming out and saying to us, um, you've already established the data. You don't need to take extra steps to, to, to make that clear to me because I know now what the data set is. And so this is a way of, of R coming through to say, you can save time by not putting all these extra steps in here. And so that's really what that, that error message means. I know that some of you have seen that message in your homework. Um, I think that perhaps the book has some examples where um, they write some, some code is written where the data set is defined and, um, and then they have this dollar sign and then they have something else. You sometimes see that. And if you go online and you see examples or tutorials of how to use R, they will use that too because that was probably written before um, R Studio uh, kind of cut this out and, and made it easier to, to code. But it still works, it's still backwards compatible, but you might now consider um, not, if you've established the data set here, you don't need to say you know, reestablish that data set unless 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 you're working from a different data set, and then that would be something you'd use. that would be something you'd use to to signify that I'm actually pulling my Y from some other set. Okay, so um, enough of that. What have I got in this graph that I've just put together? So I've, I've put, I've, I'm organizing my 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 cut uh, as the um, as the Y axis here, and you'll see that the Y axis goes up and down on the, the plot here. I'm looking at the plot on the right-hand side. So I have ideal, premium, very good, good, and fair. My x is the caret value. So what this is actually saying is that most of my carrots for ideal, premium, very good, good, and fair are gathered between the zero and three, well, maybe even two and a, two and a half. But they're, they're, they're gathered between zero and two and a half. And this suggests to me that that's probably um, what the market wants in terms of diamonds. Now, I'm not a diamond person. I don't know much about diamonds, but I'm thinking that I'm thinking that since this this data I think comes from a, from like a, a some storage place or some shop, 
But I'm thinking that since this, this place has stocked so many diamonds of this particular kind of carrot, there must be some reason. Maybe that carrot is the more, maybe they're more valuable, or maybe those are the ones that people are more likely to buy. But we see that this that, that we see that trend emerging from this from this plot. So remember that some of the uh, what we're doing in this uh, in this uh, in these in these plots here uh, is to find uh, specific types of, uh, of 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 trends or patterns that just come out when we look at the, uh, the the plots here. And so in this particular plot here, the trend is. Do I understand what this plot is telling me? The trend is that most of the diamonds in my in my selection here, or in my data set, um, have carrots between uh, seemingly zero and two and a half. Now there are some points, I'm looking at the fair diamond here, or the fair line, and I see at the very far right there is seemingly one data point for a uh, carrot which is at uh, five. Now that could be an outlier. That could be something that is completely, un maybe it's an error, completely un unreliable information. Maybe it's, maybe it's an error, maybe the person who is typing this information in, it was late, and they got tired, and they pushed the wrong button on their computer. Who knows? And so we don't know what those things are. All we know is that there are outliers in this data. That means that these are these points that now are suggesting that there is some kind of a, it, 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 these are points that don't gather with the rest of the points. So as a data scientist and analyst here, um, that would suggest that we have to go back and actually find that data point and try and explain it to see what it, what it means in terms of why it's an outlier. Um, we will spend some time talking about outliers and trying to th think about what to do with it. Um, I mean, outliers are not always bad. They sometimes do correlate to discoveries. You might find that this outlier and at, at uh, uh, x equals 5 and y equals fair, that outlier is actually the piece of information that you're looking for to really change the game. Maybe that's a discovery, you know, maybe. So the outliers are not necessarily bad. I know that a lot of people think, oh, it's just an outlier. Oh, that, that person is an outlier. An outlier is different from the rest of the group, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong or bad. And so all points, I claim, all points should be, should be observed. And they should all be studied because you might find that these outliers are the discovery. That is the discovery. This, if this data were not diamonds, supposing this data were um, where I don't know, uh, I don't know kinds of uh, or some some you know, some reactions or something. You're doing some kind of chemical experiment, and these are all reaction rates. And you find that this five is a is a different kind of rate. You might find that there's a some unknown chemical uh, reaction happening here, which is which is your discovery. And so don't discredit your outliers just yet. I mean, keep them around and study them to find out what they can be, what can be done with them. Now going back to the same plot again, um, I'm going to add some I'm going to add some color to this um, because notice how we have here we just have black and white and each point each point record is uh, is either the carrot or it's the carrot and the cut that's that's all we get. But remember that when you go back to your data set, when you go back to this data set here, you have so much information um, in your in your in your your you know, for each of these, each, on each row, you have so much information that you could use, and a lot of this data is just waiting to be used. It's all numerical data. So because you have all this data here, you may as well drop the other shoe and do some analysis on that, on that data set. And so I'm going to go back and, and, um, and look at some of these other, other pieces here. So if I go back to my code, as you can see there, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, some color information here, and so I would do that by saying, right after this y equals cut, I have this other piece of information here called price. Oh, I'm getting an error here because everything's on the, I think there's something wrong with my, what have I done now? Um, ggplot, my data, oh, you know what? It's because I have to do this, I think. I might clear that up. And I'm not sure why I'm doing this. Oh, there's unmatched brackets. Uh, I think it's goes here. Okay. Did everyone see what I just did here? I'm, I'm looking at, there's an, there's an error right here, that little x. Keep your eyes on that, because that's telling you that this code isn't going to work as it is, and if you hover your mouse over that, it will tell you that there's some kind of problem. Now this, this, this message that I'm getting isn't very helpful because it's saying an unmatched bracket from the, uh, you know, the left side, but actually it's the, it's the right Parentheses, and so sometimes you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt, but still use every use that information. 
Now, when I run this, when I run this, it should come up with a new plot here. So now I have my cut and carrot, but I also have some price information. And so let's just get to a bigger. I guess we can see here. But what this is saying though is that um, as my carrot numbers increase, so does the price. This is something that I didn't know. When the carrots are smaller numbers, they're less expensive. Maybe that explains, in fact, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm putting some ideas together, but maybe that explains why there are so many carrot diamonds here with such low values because those are less expensive to own. And maybe these outliers, we see it you know, on the carrot line here, on the, on the, the carrot is equal to five. Those, those are the most expensive diamonds that we have here, you can see by the color. Um, and what that's saying is that maybe that's why there are so few of those particular diamonds because, well, I mean, if it costs up to $15,000 to buy, to buy a rock, <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to have too many just sitting around because they might be liabilities. And so you might not just have them lying around your, 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 your store here. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say, though, is that, that we're now able to add more information to this. Now, one thing, though, that um, I'd like to do, I'm going to skip this next slide here. You can actually add some information about price if you want with, with color, um, as, as, you, as you know. But what I'd like to do, though, is I want to, I want to say, OK, well, I'm going to be, um, I want to look at the diamonds here for which um, the, the price is greater than $300 and less than $400. So this brings us back to where we were working, for, where we were working um, in, in this particular slide deck, where we're using the filter command. Now, the filter command is saying, OK, well, Let's go through the data set and let us find all the um, instances uh, where, if I can get back to my, my things here, um, we can, we're, we're, going, we're going to go back to this, sorry. Um, we're going to go back and we're going to see, okay, we're going to go through our data set and we're going to see where, for instance, for the price, uh, where is the price um, you know, greater than some value and less than some other value? In other words, we're looking to see where we can, how we can kind of, look at, we're looking at a specific type of, specific types of diamonds here. So where the price is greater than 300 and less than 400. So we're actually looking at those particular, at those particular diamonds there. So I'm going to make a new data, or a new variable here, where I'll call this my data underscore price 300 to 400, and that, and that 300 means the price is greater than 300 but also the price is less than 400. So any number, any price that exists between 300 and 400 uh, is fine with me. So as I run this, we'll see now that a new variable has appeared in my global environment, which is this right here. So if I click on this, oops, it's taking some time to come up here. Oh no, my computer's having a bad day. It's getting slow. Anyway, it, it, there we are. So what it's done is you'll notice that when you click on this, my price, 300 to 400, all the diamonds, all the rows that are here, and there are some 247 uh, rows, you can see down at the bottom here, 247 entries here, um, for which the diamonds are between 300 and $400. So this first one here is 326. So that's good to go. Now, going back to the slides, what can I do with this information? Well, what we're, what we're trying to do is we're going to be plotting only those diamonds for which the price is between 300 and 400. And so that's why, I wish I could select these things without wandering things up here. <laughs> but if I go back here and go to my notes, I'm going to just plot this thing. So, no, no, so notice not what I've just done here. I've filtered out my data set. And now I'm, I've assigned that new subdata set to this variable. And now I'm bringing in this subdata set into my plotting command here. And that means now that I can just go for specifics. And I think I need to add this next, the closing parentheses there. And then when I run this, the data thins out. But I know now that my data actually concerns diamonds for which the price is greater than 300 and less than 400. So that's this plot that I see here is actually kind of a, a subplot, I guess you would say, of the other plot, which was a super plot. So this is like a kind of a more refined plot, more specific type of information in there. Okay, neat, <laughs> neat. Let's do something else with something here. So I imagine now that I'm trying to sell these diamonds overseas. I want to sell them to people in England. And I need to convert my, uh, the prices that we have already in our data set. Remember, those prices are in dollars. And so now I want to put those prices into pounds, pounds sterling. And so what am I supposed to do 
Well, what I would like to do ideally is to create in my, my data here, uh, you see how we have this, uh, I have a, a column here that's just price up here. I'd like to make another column which is in pound sterling so that when I send this data set to say some, some buyers in London or wherever they are, um, then they have the, the pound sterling price and so they know, you know what I'm asking for. And so really all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert uh, how many dollars I have to, uh, you know, the, the, the dollar amount for each diamond here to pounds amount. Now when I did this, the, uh, the exchange was 0.76. That means uh, you can buy uh, basically three fourths of a pound with a dollar. And so what I'm gonna do now is I have to use this conversion rate to go into my, into my data set and to add another column where the pounds are now being calculated. And, the, and I'm gonna use, by the way, I'm gonna use the, um, my, um, my price column to make that calculation. So in other words, going back here, we'll see that in our data set, we have the price. I'm gonna be using that price to, um, to create my pounds. So I'm gonna make another, um, another variable here. I think that uh, I'll just call it my data price 300 to 400. I'll create that variable. And I'll put this back in, in here, go back to my notes, where am I? There we go. And I think that actually I've already added this, is that right? Probably already have. So now I've already, I've created this data set here, but I'm going to actually overwrite this data set with the, with the same data set, but now I'm going to use the mutate command, and that's going to build another column onto my, onto my, my spreadsheet. So let's just go ahead and run that and see what happens. So when I go ahead and run this, hope everything's okay, nothing crazy has happened. I'll go back to my data set and have a look, and you'll see now that there's a new column that just appeared because this is, this is, the, this is the same data which I overwrote. Sorry, this is a, most of it's the same data, but I've just created this, this new column here, which, and, then I, and then I made this new data set which I overwrote over the old data set. I do that from time to time because otherwise I'll have so many global variables just floating around that it just drives me insane. And now that I have the, the, the code and it doesn't take much time to actually create these, these things, it's, it seems okay. And it doesn't take you much time to, to recalculate these things. And so you may as well just overwrite them to save space and save yourself a headache. But now we have the conversion. So we have the price over here, and then we have the pound sterling. Hopefully you, can, I, you can't see it when I click on things. But you have the pound sterling, so you have the prices. So now what I want to take you to, I wanted to show you is if we were to go back to our slides, there's this, la this, na or this line right here where we can actually kind of, we can plot our pound sterling and just see what, what that plot would look like. Before we were using, we were using plotting, we were plotting with, with price, but now I'm going to be plotting with pound sterling just to see what that looks like. And you'll see that it really looks, since this comes up here, uh, quite similar to what we had before. And it would be quite similar because when you convert cu uh, currencies like this, um, it's a linear process. That means basically you're taking whatever value there was before and you're converting it to a new value, which is something else. So it's, it's, the plots are not going to change. The scale will change, but the plots are not going to change. And so let me just make that point. Um, I think if you go to the next slide here, I have a whole bunch of code, which just looks absolutely incredible. But what it's doing though is, if you just copy and paste this, um, you have um, two different plots here. I'm superimposing one plot on the other. I have a blue plot, which concerns price information, where I have the X is the carrot, Y is the price, and the color is, 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 um, is from dollars, blue. And then I have another plot, which I'm superimposing, where it's the same information, carrots, pounds, sterling, and, the, and this one is gonna come up in red. So red for England, blue for America. And it's, it's that kind of thing. And then I have this other line that's coming through here called the, it's the geom smooth line that I think you've, you've, you've spent some time looking at in your, in your, your lab perhaps. Um, this is gonna be making a line and I'll talk about the line in just a moment, but let me just go ahead and put this graph up here because it's, it's actually quite visually, I mean, when you look at this thing, it's, it's, actually, quite, um, it's actually quite exciting, uh, I think. I think. Um, when you see how these things, when you see, when you see this thing come up on your screen, you think, wow, that's, <laughs> it, it's a mess when you copy and paste it, but the code should still work as it is. Um, okay, don't worry about these things down here. This is just a piece of information that's coming out of our studio and our statistic uh, telling you what kind of method it's using to create the smooth lines. 
Now, because I have all this stuff running on my machine, it does take some time to actually bring up. But you can see that the data set for the red and the data set for the blue are essentially the same. The only difference is that everything's been offset. Now, remember that that offset is a result of converting the money. So we have, for instance, the, the blue is in dollars, the pound is in red, but the, it, it's essentially the same plot. Your plot is not going to change because you have a linear transformation. If you did a transformation and you, and you did a, a, an experiment like this where you found that both plots were, I mean, one was not a shadow of the other, then that would be a reason to believe that perhaps something went wrong in your conversion or maybe there was some randomness involved or something. Uh, something happened which wasn't supposed to be there. Now, one more thing I wanted to talk about with these lines, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this over as I have it and run this code and then while it's calculating I can talk a little bit about it. But now, before when we looked at our, when we looked at our, um, our slides, when we looked at our slides before, we had all this, this, I would call this clutter. This is all information about the points of themselves, actually where they are. But when you use these genome smooth lines, just like this, what this is doing is essentially taking all of your points and converting them into lines. That means you don't see the points anymore. You also don't see the outliers and you don't see the minimal, point, the minimal values and you don't see anything about the clusters. And you lose a bunch of information here. I mean, there's a lot of information that's gone. But you do have a line now which represents mathematically the distribution of points that you had. So you can see that, for instance, I'm looking at these lines here, um, where the, um, in, the min in the middle between, um, I guess, around uh, x equal or carrot equals 2, the lines begin to kind of taper off. Both of them do. Well, you can see that there's, a, there's kind of a reason for that, because there's a bunch of data that's right there. And that, that data then begins, the, the points begin to kind of taper off at about um, carrot equals 2 and 2 and 3 fourths. And then you can see that, that actually influences the line. So that line, actually, that you're seeing here, and also that I've, I hope I've just finished plotting here. There we are, I just plotted. Um, that line that you see actually is a good representation of the data points. And so you can use this to kind of get an idea about the, what they call the, the overall trends of your dot, or your, your, your scatter plot. It doesn't give you much information in terms of like where the points actually gather. Like if you wanted to find out like how your points are actually kind of like, you know, how, they, how they cluster, uh, you, you won't have that information here. But you will have, that, you will have an idea about the, the trend of the data as it fluctuates, especially if you're comparing two different lines to see whether they are the same type of data. So that's really all I wanted to say about, about that. Here's some other plots that you can, you can try if you want. They're um, kind of the same idea. Um, then I also have um, some information here about uh, other data sets you could try. In fact, there's a data set that um, if, you, if you've been looking at, um, like, you know, any, any, if, you've ever, if you've ever looked up any, any, any type of R statistic modeling work, um, chances are they might use this data set called IRIS uh, to, do, or to, to demonstrate how their, how their code would work. And so let me just show you how you can implement some of these things. Um, if you go here and I just type in, for instance, IRIS, um, I think it's already turned on as a, as a data point, or as a, as a set, and so I can just look at it. So I just type in view iris, and if I wanted to, if I wanted to work with this thing here, then I can always bring back one of my my plotting commands here. Let's just see what I can do. Ugh, let's see. Um, well, you'd have to you'd have to change these these variables here. Let's just call it sql length for this. I'm just, this is not going to be a very informative. <laughs> this is not going to be super informative because I'm just kind of I'm repeating some of the data sets here. But sepal width, <clears throat> I can put this into the um, I can put this into, into this notes up here so you can have a better idea of what's going on. But basically, it's going to be something like this. Oh, and by the way, I have to change my data to iris. And hopefully, if I run this. There we go. <clears throat> so now I'm able to do like a, what I call the back of the envelope type of calculations on these data sets, which are built into um, our statistic right here. In fact, there are many uh, data sets which are built into our statistic, and you can find them all um, if you go down to your, your if you go into your, your, your you know, if you just type in, for instance, data, open and close, um, I think, oops, there we are, type in data, open and close, you get this 
this extraordinary, what's this command there? It's not date, data. You get all these different command or all these different data sets which are just built in, which allow you to do some work. And like I was saying before, some of them are actually kind of, they're kind of, they're kind of funny. It's like they've been made with a sense of humor. And uh, we'll go through some of these in this class. But you wonder, like, you know, who actually put this information in here? And who had time to actually key all this stuff in? But actually, I'm, I'm glad that they are there, though, because it does help, um, it, it does help to, to test out some of these, these new tools when you have data that's readily available. And it's all been curated. It's all been kind of wrangled and put together in some way so that you can actually, you can actually work with some of, this, the, some of these things seemingly, like, right out of the, out of the box. I'll get one called uh, Star Wars. I, have to, I just have to see what that is. I'm sorry, guys. But data, Star Wars, uh, let's just go ahead and view that. I'm scared. May the force be with me. Oh my god. So now I have, the, I have information about Luke Skywalker. I can see how, how tall he was, what his mass was, his hair color, his skin color, his eye color, his birth year. He was born in 19.0. I'm not exactly sure I understand how that system works. Um, you can see that he was, he was male, he was masculine, uh, home world, was um, Tatooine. He's a human species, and he's been in these films. And so you can see that that's one of these data sets where it's kind of, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like you have this information there. You have A New Hope. You have, and actually, this has been updated. <laughs> I need to go through this sometime and check this out. Anyway, that is that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to end these slides here just because I think that that's the end of... Um, of, of, of a slide deck, where are we now? This is the, for the fourth week, and I think we'll move into the fifth week now. Um, as I'm doing this, please go ahead and pull over your, your new um, repository here. These slides are actually in there, and you'll find that they are week five. Um, another thing I'd like to make an, an announcement is that uh, please come to lab tomorrow, or please log into lab, because we have uh, our own Dr. Thu, who's going to be talking about data analysis in a biological setting. And so, I'm looking forward to that. I think this is going to be a really exciting, uh, really exciting talk. Are there any questions before I move on to week five? <laughs> Are we okay? Okay. I'm getting some nods now. Um, if you do have any questions, um, actually, I just have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, can we go over which data point was the outlier in the previous example with like the diamonds here? So you're going back to, I guess, right here. Here, perhaps. So that would be a point which is at uh, where fair is where the, the uh, y is equal to fair and the x is equal to about five. So let me close this down here. Let me get some move some of this get some space here. So let me get back to my is it this one here? Let's have to plot this. Make sure I'm looking at the right data set. Um, hang on, it's coming through. Okay. So what I'm looking at is, uh, it's fair. So I guess we could use a, well, we can go back to our, our, our notes here and we can use a select statement here. So actually, let's go back to my slides and see. So let's copy the actual code out of here. So if I go back to the select, actually, where is it now? Filter. We're actually going to find this thing actually by using code, which I think is going to be kind of fun. Uh, where is it? So I don't need to make everyone feel dizzy. You can always look away. <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, so select. We, we can use something like this. Or, for instance, maybe I should use this filter. Maybe filter would be better. Maybe I'll use filter. So I use filter. I'm going to just copy this in here. And I'm going to go back to my R Studio, And I'm going to go after uh, where my caret is equal to, like I'll just say it's above 4. And the cut is equal to 5. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'll just copy. This is the best way of, of, that I do this. Is that I I type I type, I type in the, uh, the the um, the code like this, and then I start working with it. Diamonds here, and what is what I'm actually working with? I'm looking at uh, cut. Also, the cut is greater than. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, no. Sorry. I'll say cut is equal to. Fair. Oops. My fingers are just not doing what I want them to do. Ah, where's that? Um, I'm allowed to do that because if you go to the, the cut quality here, actually, by the way, 
I see that fair is actually spelled with an uppercase F, so I have to make sure that I don't spell it the other way around, otherwise that's not going to work. Now the next thing is I have carrot, and I'm going to say, well, let's see what my carrot, how is that spelled? Okay, good enough. I'm going to say that carrot in my, in my code here, I want it to be equal, how about uh, greater than or equal to, what do you think, Alex, maybe, um, maybe four? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to run that, and so these are the outline, the outliers here. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll copy this into my code if you want, just to put it here so that it's on the screen so you can still see what I've been doing. I'm now going to, now that I have this, I have to, I have to I'll assign this to a, um, to a, a variable, outliers, just so I can work with it in some case, in some way here. I'm going to run that. You'll notice that outliers has now shown up in my global environment. I can click on this to view it. And so here, hopefully you can see what I'm looking at. But I'm looking at the fair and where the carrot is equal to five, it must be, um, it must be this, I guess. And so that's, that's all we get. Uh, we uh, just have numbers on our screen. And Alex, you, you raised an, an excellent question here. Um, that's all we get. We, 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 we imagine that it's an outlier, but I don't want to be prejudiced in my data set here because I don't want to say that it is an outlier. It behaves as one, but I don't know whether that's actual real data that's actually suggesting that there's something else going on. Typically, when I think of an outlier, it's a piece of information which is very different from everything else, and it seems that sometimes those outliers represent errors in data collection, something that went wrong, for instance. And I'm thinking that perhaps in this case, it could be something that went wrong, or maybe it isn't. Maybe I could use this outlier to say, what is the, um, the most valuable diamond that I have in my, in my, in my uh, supply of diamonds? And I can see that the most valuable diamond is $18,018. So it's a hugely expensive diamond just to be sitting around. And so maybe these outliers are, are reduced because they're just too valuable to have as a single thing lying around in the vault. But you would use something like this, that your, your code would be, would be very similar to that to actually isolate these, these outliers. But remember though, um, again, um, Alex, I commend you for asking an excellent question. Um, because we were able to plot this data, that's how we were able to see that there was something there to look at. There was, that's how we knew that there was an outlier to go after. If we hadn't plotted our information, if we hadn't plotted this information, then we would know nothing about how there was an outlier, uh, or how we would we never would have discovered a, a diamond here, uh, which costs eighteen thousand dollars. We never would have think we wouldn't have thought to look there, and so this goes back to um, uh, I guess the some of the, the legwork that you have to do when you're doing analysis, and that is to to do as, to run as many plots as possible. I mean, just see everything. Experience as much of the, as you can from your data set uh, to get an idea about what's there. Because I think that, um, in, in my own case, some of the discoveries that I have made in my uh, analysis have been purely by accident. I mean, I, I didn't do anything. Um, I didn't deserve them, actually. I mean, I, just, I didn't sit down and start looking around and, and saying, I, I know that there's something here, and I was looking around. But rather, but rather I, I did a, a series of plots just like this, I mean, exactly like this, I looked at not just fair and carrot, but I may have changed as much as I possibly could. Actually, before this, when I was actually plotting my, you know, when I was running plots like this, um, I was just looking to see what my variables looked like when they were on a canvas. And then I found that that was, you know, I found, I, I found that there was something worth looking at. And so then I wrote a more specific type of, uh, of, of, of query like this to actually isolate that information and create a new sub, sub data set. And that was really where the discovery began. And so as you're working with data sets, um, remember that many times you will be the first person, I mean the first person to ever see the trend that exists in that data set, often, especially if you're collecting your own data. Um, this is why um, Friday's lab is, is actually especially meaningful, um, because when you're doing data collection in a biological theater, uh, you'll find that you're collecting information um, on a reaction or some experiment 
uh, which has never happened before. And, and you're going to find something that's completely brand new. The discoveries that you find could change the world. You just have to discover them first. And you would discover them by doing these kind of global, you know, plots like this, like, I guess like this, doing a big, a, a big plot like that, and then just, just looking to see what's in there, and then you focus on something. And then once you start that focus, um, then you can actually go after um, bigger and bigger and better discoveries. So for instance, you might start out with something crazy like this. That, as, soon as, I, as soon as this comes up here, <laughs> I don't know why it takes so long. It does. Um, but what I'm trying to say, though, is that you're, um, you are going to be pioneers in this area. That means that nobody will know nobody will know the answers that you're looking for. It's up to you to find these answers. And it's, it, it is also up to you uh, to find or to actually use, um, uh, I guess, your, your skills wisely, but also to use like an ethical approach, especially if you're working with data, uh, which could be argued to be uh, confident, confidential or perhaps, um, you know, uh, of a personal nature. And so the things you find and the way you find it will be entirely up to you, but you will find discoveries that nobody knows about. And it's up to you to, to do those, you know, to, to bring those discoveries to light and to explain them to people. And that's where you have to kind of go into these points and say, okay, well, here's an outlier. Um, and then you have to find that, you know, why that, find out why that's an outlier. Why should we call this an outlier? Is it an outlier or is it the, is it the discovery itself? Anyhow, um, excellent question, Alex. You, you really kind of, you, you got me all wound up here. <laughs> but so that's the, end of, that's the end of this slide deck here. I'm going to move into the next one. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I think earlier my volume was turned down, so I didn't hear. If, but if you have questions, please let me know still. Um, okay, I'm going to move here. So this brings us in, into the next, in fact, that's a well-timed well uh, question there, um, Alex. Because it brings us into our next big area, which is what I call the exploratory data analysis. This is the back of the envelope analysis here, where you're going to be looking at different data sets and trying to find out, is there anything going on here? It's kind of like you're taking a data set and you're conducting some kind of an interview and seeing whether, for instance, there's, is there anything in that data set? But in order to actually create the interview of the data, uh, oftentimes you have to create a, a working space or a, 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 a place where you can actually store your data in R. And so we're going to use a new library here called Tibble, which I think it sounds like a, the name of some kind of you know, cute little panda bear thing, little Tibble. But this is going to be a new library which we're going to use to actually design uh, data frames. And so this is going to be, um, I mean, it's actually quite an important uh, library to use if you're just, if you're actually creating your own data. So it grows data tables from data, and then you can create. Once your, ta once your data is in a, in a table, then you can start going after it with plotting tools and things. I, I should probably mention that now, but when you just have data, um, it doesn't, you, you can't always just start plotting things. Sometimes you have to wrangle the data by actually putting it into some kind of structure, like a data structure, where you have like your columns, and you have your rows, and the information has some kind of relationship between every piece of information has some kind of relationship with every other piece some kind of relationship and you would establish all those relationships in this using this library here called tibble um, if you haven't installed tibble before go ahead and copy this install packages tibble uh, directly into your r statistic right here in fact what i'm going to do before i do that actually before i run it i'm going to type in this command here called rm list is equal to ls and Oops, this is a command you might want to remember, but what this thing does is it removes all existing variables. So if I run this, watch close, watch my global environment, everything is gone. And so I've, I've just lost my variables. In fact, what I'm going to do also is I'm going to remove the, um, if I click on the little broom that's where my, uh, under, where, my, where my plot is, I can clear all these plots just because that's, uh, I, don't want to, I don't want those plots there to distract me. So anyway, now I'm back to this, to up here. I'm going to go ahead and run my install packages tipple. It's going to give me a message I see here that says updating loaded packages should be reinstall or restart R. I'll just say yes. Restarting R isn't a bad thing. What it does is it just, I think if you have a Windows machine, sometimes when you make an installation, you have to um, you have to turn off the machine and back on again. You have to restart the machine. 
Um, that's, uh, that sometimes has to happen in R2, especially when you're installing packages. And so you're not turning the machine off, but you're just restarting the whole R kernel. So anyway, everything seems to work OK. I seem, I, I seem to be able to install my, my stuff without any, without any trouble. And now I'm going to run my tibble. And I also have to install this other library here called Tidyverse, as we remember, one of our favorite libraries, surely. And oops, when I copy and paste this, I want to put everything on its own line just to make it run. I think otherwise it doesn't run. Sometimes I think we have some trouble. OK. Now, um, we don't have a huge amount of time here. But um, we will be, and we will be able to finish these slides here. We will pick them up on, on, on Monday here. But we will cover how we can actually create a, a, a data frame here. So imagine now that this is my, my data is A1, B1, C1, D1. That's my first row, my second, or my first column. My second column is A2, B2, C2, D2. I would organize my data in code that looks like this to actually create a data frame. Now, a data frame is uh, R speak for creating an environment that holds data with some organization, a data environment. Um, now, I know this is just, why does this look so crazy? <sighs> why is that looking so strange here? So hang on, let me just, or, let me just organize things a little bit here. Uh, you know what? Is there anywhere this is all written out nicely? I wonder if I can just copy this. I think, OK, I'm going, to, I'm going to ignore the first piece of code there from our slides. I'm going to ignore uh, this. I'm going to ignore the, the code from the first slide here because that doesn't seem to copy very well. But if I, if I run this, if I copy the second slide, at least on my machine, it seems to work. And that's where this code here came from. So when I run this, again, the code looks kind of all over the place. And it would be nice if I could just organize things in a maybe more, a more coherent way. And so maybe I can just do this. Oops. And so you can get an idea about how the, the columns were actually being loaded. But the idea is that I've just created this sample data. And if I click on this, you'll see that sample data uh, is, I'll just close these things down so I don't get confused. Uh, sample data uh, now has, I've just created kind of a, a spreadsheet uh, in memory, if you will. And so I have column one, column two, column three, column four. And in fact, you don't need to look at the, um, you don't need to look at the, the upper left-hand side of this thing. You can always just type in names followed by sa oops, sample data. And these are my names. Um, another thing you could do if you wanted to is I could say that, for instance, I wonder if I could do this. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll wait. We'll get back to that. Um, well, let's do this. I wonder if I can do this. Let's just say here a. I'm going to try and I'm going to try and change the name of the columns here just to see whether this works. I think it will. Oops. Ah, it does work. Okay, so what I can do is I can actually change the names of my columns um, by a command like this. Remember this C open and close parentheses. This is my big problem with R statistic, and that is that C makes a vector. It should have been V as in victory, not C as in computer, but it should have been V rather than C. But this says take all of these elements here and put them into an array. But actually what this is doing here is it says for our names of our sample set here, in fact, you won't see this update until I actually click on this again. There you go. But for our names of the column, or our, our column names here, change those, assign these values here. And so that means that the first thing is going to be set to A, the second thing is going to be set to B, and the third is set to C, and so on and so forth. So I, I can actually change these things around as much as I like. And so now you have this, this new command you can use to, to change the column names. And you might do that. Um, I know that I do that because when I, when I download data, sometimes the data set isn't very informative. It doesn't actually provide me with any it's hard to understand what they mean. So I sometimes change the name so that it's, it's more meaningful uh, to me. Um, anyway, but getting back to this thing, you can see that um, in, your, in your slides here, the, um, you can see that the rows, in fact, I'll just go back to where we were before, just maybe it's easier that way. But you can see that as I look at my rows, row A, I'm sorry, uh, column A, B, C, and D, 
these are these um, these are these uh, um, my columns here. I, 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 each column has a name. In fact, I might go back to the way it was spelled out before, just because it might be easier that way. But you can see that column one is uh, A B C D one. Column two is A two B two C two D two. I'll just run my, my old code again. By the way. Column three and four, you can kind of get an idea about how these columns are being organized here. And the rows now are where the letters are the same. So A's, B's, C's, and D's. And so you have this now this ability to actually create what is called in our, um, in our, in our statistic, um, you're actually creating um, a, uh, a data frame. And a data frame is a workspace that you can use to actually create your um, you can actually start. You can plot here. You can you can you can send this data frame to models. There are different libraries, for instance, in R that will only work with data frames, um, and they do that so that it, it helps to kind of standardize the way that certain types of functions work with data. So, for instance, if you had an R statistic here, um, a bunch of functions. Some functions worked with only with individual numbers. Other functions worked with only individual uh, pieces of text, and then you had another function that would that would work with uh, with numbers. And if you had if you had all these constraints, then it would be very difficult to program. So instead, many of these libraries just say, take all the data that you want me to work on, wrap it up in a, in a spreadsheet table like this, and then send it to me, and then I will work it. And so that's why we're, we're spending time talking about this tibble here, because if you have data, you may need to put this into some kind of a spreadsheet format, which is, again, wrangling, where you're actually kind of organizing things. But once it's in there, then you can start to um, you can actually start to work with it. I mean, notice before that when we were when we were plotting things with our diamonds data, um, not here, but when we were when we were plotting data with our diamonds data, the um, all the data came prepared in the spreadsheet, and so that spreadsheet was the data frame that we were able to use to plot. ggplot, for instance, needs to have data served to it in some format like this. 